Hi, Govan, and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. In continuing my Silmarillion synopsis series, we now come to the Quinta Chapter 20 of the Fifth Battle, Nirnaith Arnoidiad. You may notice that this is the first battle that doesn't get a Dagor in the front because it's not called the Battle of, it's just called the Nirnaith Arnoidiad, which will be explained in due course. But let's go ahead and get started. A couple of quick announcements before we actually get into the meat of the video here. First of all, Marquette University is collecting a number, I think, of 6,000 interviews from Tolkien fans on how they encounter Tolkien, why they're fans of Tolkien, and what Tolkien means to them personally. Really short three-minute interviews, um, and I will link in the description below where you can actually sign up to give one of these interviews yourself. It's basically conducted uh, either in person or online depending on how close you are to Marquette University, uh, but they have time slots blocked out for doing the interviews, and the link in the description below will basically take you to the page where you can sign up, and it'll explain everything you need to do there. Pretty cool opportunity for Tolkien fans. Secondly, if you are YouTube user Mr. Nintendo, based on the best information I have, you are the 2,000th subscriber to the channel, and because of that, lucky you, you get to pick a topic for a video. So if you're interested in doing that, please leave a comment in a video somewhere. I will find the comment and follow up with a video on the topic of your choice, as long as it's you know, within reason. Uh, if you put something in there that <laughs> is just way out there, something that I, requires information that I don't really have access to, then I'll let you know and you can pick a different one. But, you know, if Mr. Nintendo, pick a topic. The chapter actually begins with a brief epilogue to the Baron and Luthien story, which of course was the preceding chapter, and it tells us that when Baron and Luthien returned from Valinor with their mortal forms, they returned to Doriath and met King Thingol, who had basically fallen into a deep depression, and seeing Luthien again kind of revived that, but Melian looks into Luthien's eyes and she kind of reads what has happened there and she knows that Luthien has chosen mortality, and because of that, now Melian is very grieved because she knows that they'll be separated by, you know, the the different fates of men and elves, because elves, you know, live forever basically with the with the life of, of Arda itself, whereas men, they don't know where they go. Nevertheless, once they've, you know, basically talked to Thingol and Melian for a bit, they leave Doriath, and go off on their own, and they go into the east towards the, where the Green Elves live in Osirion, and it tells us that they live there basically for the rest of their lives, and after that no mortal man ever sees Baron again, and nobody knows where they died or where their bodies lay. And that really kind of caps off the Baron and Luthien story for us. Now the end of Baron and Luthien's story kind of leads into the beginning of this chapter because where this gets kicked off is Mithros, the eldest of Feanor's sons, learning of the success of Baron's quest, realizes Morgoth is not totally undefeatable, and he comes up with an idea that, you know, maybe if we can all get ourselves together again and, you know, attack him and do this right, we might be able to overcome him in the end. And so he devises what's called the Union of Mithros, and he's basically trying to pull together all the different factions uh, across Beleriand to join in this effort. Unfortunately, the Oath of Feanor has wreaked some havoc among the relations between elves and other peoples in Middle-earth because, as of course we learned in the Be uh, Baron and Luthien chapter, Kelgorm and Kurufin reminded Finrod of their oath when he decided to go help Baron, and then they did all that stuff with Luthien that really ticks off Thingol, and so Doriath isn't really sending any help to Mithros' effort. Although it does tell us that two of uh, Thingol's chief warriors, Mablung of the Heavy Hand, who is his, basically his captain, and then Beleg Strongbow, who will become a major character later, who is kind of like his main march warden, they both want to go just because they don't want to be left out of the action, and Thingol gives them permission to do that. But otherwise, nobody from Doriath goes. Likewise, because of what Kelegorm and Kurufin did in Nargothrond, Orodreth, who is now king after Finrod died, basically says, 
I'm not sending any of my people to, you know, fight under the banner of any son of Feanor, so you can forget that. However, there is a contingent that leaves Nargothron, which basically it's because there's this one prince there named Gwyndor whose son, who not son, brother died in the Dagor Bragalach, the previous major battle, and he really wants revenge, so he takes a fairly large contingent, but by no means a, you know, a majority of the people of Nargothrond, and he decides to uh, go, but Orodreth basically tells him, look, you can fight on, under the f banners of Fingon, but you're not doing anything with the Feanor people. So he does join up with the, the people from Hithlam under King Fingon, who, and Fingon is totally on board with the idea. Basically, everybody from Hithlum is going. The men from Dor Loman and Hithlum are going. Uh, Mithros gets, uh, with the other sons of Feanor, gets support from the dwarves in the east from Nogrod and Belagost. Um, and they gather all the sons of Feanor from kind of their dispersed areas. And, of course, the men from... Dorthonian were already pretty much wiped out, so that's not much of a thing. But basically, apart from Nargothrond and Doriath, most everybody is on board with this. Now, the plan that they came up with was for Mithros to attack from the east and be kind of the main assault, which he was happy to do because he hates Fe he hates Morgoth being the son of Feanor and all that. And then Fingon in the west, after the the two sides have engaged he would come out and then take the armies of Morgoth in the middle, and between them they would just kind of crush them in a, as a hammer and anvil. So Fingon's army is basically hiding out in the woods, waiting for Mithros' signal. Unfortunately, Morgoth, because he's got some of the men who are allied with Mithros, you may remember the whole story about Bor and Ulfong coming from the east, and their men kind of joining themselves to Mithros. Well, he's got spies among those people, and he knows kind of what their plan is. And Mithros himself, his entire army is delayed by treachery from Ulfang and his sons, who are kind of trying to make him believe that there's some other threats they need to deal with, so he gets delayed. Meanwhile, Turgon, who, sh who of course was hiding in Gondolin, had heard about all this going on, and he decides now is the time that we're going to send forth an army. So he comes with a bunch of people from Gondolin and meets up with Fingon's people, and this is really enheartening to them, and so they're really happy about this because nobody even knew where he was or how to get in touch with him. But he learns about all this, and he shows up. So Mithros is delayed, and while he's delayed, the people of Fingon are basically just waiting in the woods outside of the sight of Morgoth's armies, but Morgoth knows they're there because he knows their plans. So what he does, he sends this emissary out, and the emissary is trying to taunt them into coming out and fighting, and finally what they do, because they can't seem to get any response out of them, they bring an elf who happens to be, by the way, Gwyndor's brother, who he thought had died in the previous battle, they bring him out and they basically chop off his hands, his arms, and just kill him really, really cruelly in front of the entire host. And as you can imagine, that sets off Gwyndor and his people like match to dry kindling. And so all of a sudden, they're, they're not paying any attention to anything. They just decide, we're going to go out there and kill these guys. Now, the assault of Gwyndor and his contingent from Nargothrond is so heavy when they attack because they're so enraged that it almost kind of takes Morgoth's plans and makes them backfire because they chased the orc army that had come to, you know, basically to the front of where Fingon's forces were, and they basically chased them all the way across the plain to the very gates of Angmon. Now the rest of the elves, unfortunately, and the men are behind, and so when they finally get to the gates, Morgoth is kind of like, eh, this is this is worrisome. But his backup army, which was, you know, he sent out this other army to kind of draw them out, and then he has this huge backup army, which then comes out and cuts off Gwyndor and the Nargothron contingent and basically captures or kills all of them. And the rest of the elves and men who were following with Fingon get driven back. 
and at this point begins the Niranith Arnoidiad, which it tells us means unnumbered tears, and that's because things get really ugly from here. Once the battle begins in earnest, Fingon is driven back, and the men of Brethil, who were with his group as well as the men of Hador from Dor Loman, uh, you may remember the people from Brethil or the people of Haleth, uh, Fingon, he, they're basically acting as his rear guard and basically all of them get killed. Fingon is getting overwhelmed, but luckily Turgon, who had restrained all of his people from the rash attack, they come up and save them from being completely overwhelmed. Turgon actually meets up with Fingon, and of course they being brothers, they're really, you know, happy to meet up. Hurin is also there because he's the, the leader of the men of Dor Loman at this point. And Torgon and Hurin, of course, have met before, and they're really happy, and they've kind of restored their hope, and they're really hoping that they can pull this off. However, the orc onslaught is really bad, but right around this time, in the east, they hear the trumpets of Mithros, and it looks like they might actually pull things off. But Morgoth, at the same time, loses basically everything he's got, Balrogs, Orcs, you name it, the entire army he has built up is now loosed. And unfortunately, Mithros is attacked in the rear by the sons of Ulfong, who are, of course, in league with Morgoth. And so he's dealing with people on both sides of his army at this point. Also key to this part of the battle, Glaurung is also with this last contingent that Morgoth loses, and it's partially because of him that the forces of Mithros and Fingon are kept apart, and basically he's fully grown now and causing all kinds of devastation and wreaking havoc in Mithros' army. Luckily, the dwarves have armor that helps them withstand the, uh, the fire of the dragon, and they kind of hedge him in a bit while Mithros' army kind of gets out, but the the leader of the dwarves actually gets crushed by Glaurung, but he also stabs him in the belly, and after that, Glaurung leaves the field. However, because of the treachery of Ulfang's sons, Mithros can't really end up doing anything, although it's believed by some that had they not been treacherous, they might have actually won the day. Nevertheless, the sons of Bor actually kill some of the, the sons of Ulfang, and so it, they prove to be faithful in the end after all. But as a result of all this, Mithros and the rest of the sons of Feanor are basically scattered, and they just flee all over Beleriand. They don't, they basically got nothing left, and the dwarves that survive go back east to Nogron and Belagost as well. Meanwhile, in the west, Fingon and Turgon are being separated by this last uh, army loosed by Morgoth, and in particular, Gothmog, who is the captain of the Balrogs, basically is fighting Fingon hand to hand, and they're fighting it out, and then another Balrog comes from behind Fingon, wraps, a, you know, its fiery whip around his leg, and basically catches him by surprise, and then Gothmog basically takes a his blade and cuts right through Fingon's helmet, and thus the second High King of the Noldor bites the dust just like Fingolfin did, although at least in this case he wasn't rash enough to challenge Morgoth. Anyway, Fingon gets killed, and pretty much all of the elves of Hithlum are overrun. Turgon, who is separated, is now with Hurin and Huor, and they're trying to guard the passes of Sirion, which is fairly close to where Gondolin is, and Hurin basically tells him, look, you need to get out of here while there's still time, because as long as Gondolin survives, Morgoth will have something to fear, and there may be, you know, some hope left. Turgon basically says, well, it can't remain hidden for long after this, and if it becomes, you know, known where it is, then it will fall. And Huor, Hurin's brother, speaks up and basically says, that may be true, but... I speak with the foresight of death that, you know, from your house there will be hope from for the the Eldar, and from you and me a new star shall rise. Now, it's not really clear what he means by this. It's kind of a metaphorical prophecy, but it just so happens that Maeglin, who you may remember, overhears this, and that's really the only comment we get about this is that Maeglin overhears it and remembers it. But this will become significant later, so keep it in mind. 
So Turgon does manage to retreat. He gathers some of the people of Fingon who had kind of managed to get out of the fray, and he makes his way to Gondolin while the men of Dor Loman basically act as his rear guard. Huor ends up taking an arrow to the eye and dies. Hurin basically ends up being the last man standing, literally, and is just cutting down orcs left and right with his axe. And it's partially because he's been ordered to be taken alive. Morgoth wants him alive because he wants to know where Gondolin is, since he you may remember from an earlier chapter, he heard this rumor that they probably went to Gondolin when they were missing for about a year. So he wants him taken alive, and so Hurin is just killing these orcs left and right, and he keeps shouting in Elvish, they shall come again. So he's basically expressing his hope that this is not the final nightfall, but nevertheless, after killing plenty of orcs, he eventually is just overwhelmed by sheer numbers, and they in fact do take him alive to Angband. Unfortunately, as a result of this battle and the treachery of the sons of Ulfang, elves and men basically become estranged after this, other than the three houses of the Edain, the people of Hador, the people of Haleth, and the peop and Beor's house, although most of them are gone now. Um, but you've got really bad fallout there, which lasts basically forever after. So if you're not among one of those three houses of men, elves are a little bit wary of friendship with men. Sons of Feanor basically end up making their way to where the Green Elves live in Osirion. Fingon's realm is no more. Basically all the elves of Hithlum that survived went off with uh, Turgon to Gondolin. And with Hithlum basically undefended, Morgoth ends up giving it to the sons of Ulfong and their people. He had promised them kind of the richer lands further south, but he basically sticks them in Hithlum, which is far north and surrounded by mountains and not that pleasant, and says, you stay there, because why would you trust Morgoth to give you anything nice, basically? And while there, they basically oppress the remainder of the basically old men, children, and women from the men of Dor Loman, and things get pretty ugly there. Other elves fled south to the havens where Círdan was, but unfortunately, these also are eventually taken by Morgoth and destroyed, but Círdan and Iranian, who will become known as Gilgalad, with some of the other elves, manage to escape to the Isle of Balar, which is basically in the bay near where the, the, the havens are. And so not all the elves there are taken, but the havens themselves are destroyed. Nevertheless, Círdan keeps up the whole shipbuilding business, which becomes relevant later on. Morgoth is not too worried about Norgothrond or Doriath, but he is worried about Gondolin. For one thing, he hates the, the house of Fingolfin, which is what Turgon is Fingolfin's son, because Fingolfin wounded him in their one-on-one -on -one fight. Turgon also, specifically, it tells us, every time Morgoth would walk past him in Valinor, he got this premonition like Turgon would be his undoing somehow, and so he really wants to know where Gondolin is. And so he questions Hurin, which is why he ca had him captured alive. And Hurin basically mocks him and says, I'm not telling you anything. You're just, you know, an escaped thrall from Valinor. Uh, Morgoth basically says, you're wrong. I am the master of the fates of Arda and I control everything. And Hurin nevertheless won't talk. So Morgoth decides, well, if you won't talk, I will prove to you that I am master of the fates of Arda. I'm going to set you in this chair way up high and chain you there, and what you're going to see with basically my sight is I'm going to curse your people, your wife, your children, and everything that they do is going to be cursed, and just everything that happens to them is going to be horrible, and I'm going to make you watch. At the end of the chapter, which is an extremely depressing chapter, possibly the most depressing, we do, however, get a slight image of hope. It tells us at the end of the battle, the orcs pile up all the slain with all their stuff just into this huge mound. And it tells us this, is, this mound is actually reared in the Anfoglith, which was Argalan, the green plain that was just south of the gates of Angban, but in the Dagor Bragalach became just a wasteland. But um, in this wasteland alone, this one hill of the slain grows grass. And so there's a little bit of an image there of 
resistance and hope, maybe, but that is pretty much the only thing we get at the end of this chapter that gives us any reason to think anything good might happen. And that's the end of the Nirnaith Arnoidiad, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. So, hope you enjoyed that uh, video. If enjoy was, I don't know, maybe you'd have to have Schadenfreude to enjoy that. But at any rate, hope you did enjoy the exposition a little bit. Hope you learned something. And this chapter sets up the next one, which will be another of the great tales, which tells us of Turin Turambar. And that's going to be a really long one, but it'll be a really good one too. So be, be ready for that. Uh, otherwise, of course, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do that at J-R-R-T Lore. I occasionally drop some Tolkien trivia there, fun stuff. And of course, you can also subscribe to the channel here. Don't forget to click that bell icon. You can, of course, support the channel here, and you can find two of my previous videos here. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namariye. No